How is it going everyone? I am Dylan, this is All You Can Board, and this game right here, this is Octopus's Garden. It's up on Kickstarter right now, you can find the link in the description. It's published by Maple Games, it's designed by Roberta Taylor, and it's a really, really fun tile placement game that borrows some mechanics from uh, other games I've played, but meshes them all together in a really elegant way with, uh, the best way to describe it is that it's a very simple game to learn, and the rule set is very simple, but the strategy depth is very, very deep if it's something you want to explore into and play multiple sessions. The game changes as you add these uh, you know optional module modular sets into the game so there's sets of tiles that you don't have to play with but if you do there'll be new rules that are sort of added in with them it's a very fun little game very easy to learn um, the first thing you're probably gonna think of when you hear this game is of course the song Octopus's Garden by the really popular band ACDC uh, I'm just kidding obviously I know Octopus's Garden is by Led Zeppelin <laughs> Um, this is a really, really cool game. We're gonna jump into uh, sort of a mini tutorial. I'm gonna uh, give you a bit of a, a background on how it plays, run down so you can understand things a little better. It won't be super in-depth. This won't be a full tutorial as this is a prototype. Things can change, but I'll give you a bit of an overview. And after that, I'm gonna give you all my thoughts and my time with the game so you can help to inform your decision on whether you want to back this for yourself. So stick with me and we'll learn how to play. All right, so there are four steps to a turn in Octopus's Garden. The first of which is called Harvesting Pearls. Now you can look at pearls as essentially the current of this game, that's your income. So during this stage, you're collecting your base income based on how many oysters are on your board. Now the board starts with two oysters on it, which means that you have a base income of two pearls to start. You can increase that by getting these oyster tokens and adding them to your board. Each one is going to increase your income by one, but it's also gonna give you minus two points at the end of the game, which means you're balancing, increasing your income by also sacrificing points every time you do. Now there are ways to eliminate these oysters from the board after they're on there, but the time in the game that you choose to do that is important because you're essentially decreasing your income, but you wanna do that before the game's over so that you don't have these negative points. It's a really cool mechanic, but this first stage, all you have to know is that you're essentially just counting up how many oysters you have and adding that many pearls to your, to your income, essentially. The second stage is collecting and planting garden tokens. These are the garden tokens on the market board right here. Um, you have to take an entire row or an entire column, and you have to be able to afford that entire row or column to take them. So you're always taking three at a time, um, and you're always adding up the entire cost of them and paying that. You can't say, I only want these two, so I'm only gonna pay for those two. You have to take the entire row or column. If you've played a game like Cat Lady, there's a very similar mechanic there. You, you had a, a grid of nine cards, three by three, and you have to take an entire row or column, very similar here. The only difference is that in Cat Lady, after you take a row or column, the next person couldn't take that exact same row or column. It was blocked by a cat token. In this game, there's no blocking of that kind, so you're always able to take whichever row or column you would like. The third stage of the game, um, or I should mention also when you're cho when you're buying those uh, tiles from the market board, uh, you have the option to, to pass if you don't want to take any, but you also have the option to instead buy one of the oyster uh, tokens I was talking about and add it to your board. Those are always available. There's a nice little supply of them here for you to buy whenever you would like. Uh, the cost of the oysters, I should mention also as well, is always increasing. So you're always adding up how many oysters you have in total, and that's how much the oyster is going to cost. So that every time you want to increase your income, it costs more, which means you have to balance do I, does it make sense to spend five pearls now for this one new oyster to get me in, a, a single extra income every single turn? How many turns do I think are left in the game? Is that gonna balance itself out? It's a re neat little mechanic to sort of say, is it worth it to increase my income? The next stage is a really special st a step, I should say, of the turn, which is moving any sea stars and hermit crabs uh, in your personal garden. So there are these unique tiles. We have one out here called a sea star. There's also uh, hermit crabs as well. Um, they are going to be having their own special step because they are have this a sort of a unique function compared to the other tiles in the game. So let's start with sea stars. Sea stars are hungry and are attracted to delicious looking oysters. So if you do have any sea stars during this stage of the game and you also have any oyster tiles, not the oysters that are on your board to begin with, you must now move each of these sea stars one space closer to the nearest oyster. If any sea stars move on top of an oyster, that oyster is now essentially gone. The sea star has consumed it. You do not get the income from that oyster anymore, but now you also do not lose the two points for that tile at the end of the game. Every turn, the sea star will move one spot closer to the oyster until it's able to consume it. Hermit crabs function in much the same way, but rather than looking for oysters, they're looking for a home. A home for a hermit crab is either an empty shell or a trash token. 
And another difference between hermit crabs and sea stars is that hermit crabs do not have to move one space every turn. It's up to you whether you would like them to, but eventually you do want them to find a home because they'll be worth more points to you at the end of the game that way. For instance, an empty shell token by itself is only worth one point, but if you're able to get one of your hermit crabs onto that empty shell, it's now worth six points. In the case of both sea stars and hermit crabs, they can move on top of other tiles as well. So the tiles do not block them from moving. The only exception to that rule are the coral tokens. Those ones, they will have to go around. And if they have no path, they will be trapped by coral tokens. And the final step of a turn is refill the market board. Any tiles you purchase that have left open spots on the board, you're gonna refill from the bag and then your turn's done. It passes to the next player and you're gonna continue playing this way until one player finishes filling up their entire board. That is going to trigger the end game. That'll be the last turn. And then you're gonna calculate points. Points are scored in a ton of different ways and that's because all these tiles have different rules associated with them and different ways that they score. And that's where the tactical depth of Octopus's Garden really comes from is it is very simple in how it plays. You are doing the same thing every turn with buying rows and columns and just adding them to your board wherever you would like. So it seems very simple, but where you place those tiles, when you acquire them and what ultimately you're trying to do to maximize your points is where all the depth comes from. So for instance, a tile like uh, this anemone tile um, basically is only worth two points, but that's not all it does. If you collect three of them in one grouping, as soon as you do, you take the top tile from this pile here with these little clownfish on them, and whatever amount of points that are listed there is an additional bonus you get for having been the, the person to get uh, first person to get three grouped together. The next player to do that is also going to get one, but now the value of this one is only a six compared to seven, which means that you're getting less points if you were not the first player to do it. So, in in much of a similar way, there's a similar mechanic to uh, the seagrass tiles. Uh, those ones are getting you these little. Um, Seahorses, I was gonna say horseshoes for a second. These are not horseshoes. Uh, seahorse tiles in much the same way, but you have to get five of those seagrass tiles rather than three grouped together. There's a whole bunch of different tiles. I'm not gonna go through them all, especially because there's also a bunch of bonus tiles included here, all of which are optional, and each of them have their own rules that if you add them to the game, it's gonna change the way you play. But just, just to throw out a couple other ones, we did mention coral tiles. These are the only ones that don't have anything else associated with them. They're only worth a single point, um, but they are gonna block your uh, sea, sea stars and hermit crabs from moving around the board. So there can be some strategy in terms of how you're laying those out. There are, of course, the hermit crabs and the sea star tokens that we talked about that are moving around the board. Sea stars are consuming oysters. Hermit crabs are looking for homes. Um, there are relics, which I don't have any out here, but they have this little like gold cup on them. Um, relics you wanna try to collect multiples of. So if you only collect one, it's I believe it's worth zero points. But if you collect two, it's worth two points. If you collect three, they're worth each, I should say they're each worth two points. And if you collect three, they're each worth five points. You can get a max of 15 for having three um, or uh, you know 20 for having four um, for the more that you collect that way. So, and then of course there's trash tiles, which are all worth minus one. You do not want to have to take these, but because you have to take an entire row, row or column, sometimes you're obligated to take one. Um, first one's worth minus one. Next one, now they're both worth minus minus two, next one now they're all worth minus three each. So it increases a lot, that's where your hermit crabs can come into play where they can use trash as a home, even though you don't get as many points as you would if they found a shell for a home, it does take the negative points away from you. So you can even tell from these tiles, there's a lot of different uh, st strategy options going on, a lot of ways that you can try to plan your board to maximize your points. All right, so Octopus's Garden, what a what a pleasant surprise this game was to me. Not that I was expecting it, you know, not to be a hit for me, but um, I just love when a game that has a certain look to it and I have high hopes for hits all the right notes and, and this one definitely did. So what I love so much about this game is what I, you know draws me to a lot of these tile, uh, these types of tile placement games is that they, I almost want to, I don't want to call it uh, the, the Pixar effect, but that, that's sort of what I call it in my internal group is we talk about it, how, you know, going to Pixar movies with, with uh, kids is, uh, is such a, you know, usually enjoyable experience for adults because the adults enjoy the movies just as much as the kids do because there's a whole bunch of jokes and, and things in it that maybe they go over the kid's head but land with the parents and, you know, kids enjoy it for one reason and parents enjoy it for another. So it's, it's an enjoyable experience for everyone. It transcends, you know, age gaps and, and things like that. Um, what I find with games like this is that they are very easy to learn and very easy for most people to play and enjoy. But if you want to explore a deeper depth and really get into the strategy that's 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 there and, and play play it multiple times with the same people and feel like you're really competing and maximizing your 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 economy with the pearls and in your scores, you can absolutely do that. And there's so much room to do that in this game, but it's not necessary to enjoy it. Those are the games that end up being such a hit with a lot of people that I'm introducing games to because I don't have to worry about 
you know, explaining a game and knowing that I'm going to be at this massive advantage because this game really relies on, you know, having the best strategy. And if you don't execute it early, you're out of the game and it's going to be unenjoyable. Octopus's Garden strikes a really good balance of being super fun, but having that ability to really dive into it deeper if you would like. So all that being said, the best part in my mind, uh, the thing I enjoy the most is all the flexibility of the modular, they call them uh, expert modules, I believe, um, or, or ex expert variants or something like that. Um, I, I think that that's almost like, I, I understand why that they call it that, but I, don't, I think tying the word expert to it, I'm hoping it doesn't deter some people from being like, oh, that's gonna be too complicated because it doesn't, in my opinion, make the game much more complex. It just adds variety to the game. So whereas these are all the base tiles that you're used to, there's I think eight or nine different sets of tiles that you know will be four of this one or two of this one that you can add to the bag that may or may not come up in your game depending on what, what you draw because not every tile comes out, but there's they have new abilities. So there's, like a, there's one that's a diver. There's one that's like a, I think they call it coconut coconut octopus or something like that. There's a shark, there's a treasure chest. They all have their own different abilities tied to them. So I'm not gonna go over them all, but they, they can change the game in a lot of different ways, excuse me, if those tiles come out. So I love that because not only is each one its own way of modifying the game, in conjunction with each other, there's all different combinations you can try. If you wanna get really crazy with it, you can put every single module in the bag because you've played a whole bunch of this game and you wanna have a wild experience. Or you might realize that, hey, the combination of you know the shark and the diver makes for a really fun experience for us, or the diver and the treasure chest, whatever the case may be. Everyone's gonna have their own combinations that they're, they're drawn to and have a lot of fun with. There's tons of exploration with that. You're allowed, you can try exploring different combinations and each module set every time you play. Um, I think even just to see it all, it's gonna require so many playthroughs of Octopus's Garden, unless you're including them all in the bag right away. Uh, there's just tons of flexibility. I, I really appreciate when games give you that variety because you know, a lot of games, uh, there's so many board games out there. And what happens is that sometimes you can play a board game a whole bunch and then say, you know, I've, I've played this, I played it out. And then at that point, you're either going to a new game or you're waiting for an expansion pack. This almost feels like they've included eight or nine expansions in the box, essentially, saying here are other ways you can expand the game. You likely won't include them for the first few plays, maybe a, a whole bunch of plays, but now you, you have a way to expand your game right in the box without having to wait for something else to be released. So again, this is a prototype. Some of these things may change, which which uh, expert modes are in the, the box may change. I, based, uh, basing it on the prototype, I just am super, super blown away by how much variety there is. I love it so much. And then pulling it back to sort of the tactical and strategic discussion I was talking about, um, it's really, really interesting, the oyster tiles. That's one of the, the most interesting things that struck me and Carlo when we were first playing is that your, your income is never, you know, a lot of games your income is just steadily increasing or you'll find that like you're, you know, you have that feeling of being more powerful at the end of the game than you were at the, at the start of the game. And usually that is tied to your income and what you can afford. This is variable income of how much do I want to increase my income now because each oyster is going to cost me increasingly more to get. So I have to start weighing how much is this oyster going to make me over the course of the game? Is it more valuable to just not get the oyster or how much do income do I need for what I want to buy right now? Um, but then also because the oysters will eventually make their way off your, bo uh, off your board as these sea stars are consuming them, you have to decide when you want to invest in sea stars, when you want those sea stars, where are you going to put them? Because you have to uh, calculate how many turns it's going to take for the sea star to make it across the board to consume the oyster um, because you want to eliminate the negative points of that oyster but as soon as you do, you're losing income. It has the same kind of feeling if you've played uh, Dominion where you want to get the, I think it's called the estates, the ones that give you like seven points for whatever for each card at the end of the game. But now there's these dead cards in your deck that you might draw that do nothing except give you seven points at the end of the game. So when you invest too heavily in them early, you end up with a bunch of dead hands. It's sort of the same thing here. You're, if you eliminate your oysters too quickly, you're going to have very little income to buy things, but you do want to eliminate them to, to negate the negative points. It's a really interesting mechanic and the way that they handle it here with not, with like not only just saying, oh, I bought the sea star, so it eliminates an oyster, but also where you place it on your board to say, oh, it's four spaces away from this oyster, which means I know I have four turns before it consumes the oyster. That gets really interesting because your opponent can also say, I wonder if I can end the game by filling my board before that other player is able to... Uh, get rid of all their oysters. So it's a really interesting mechanic. It makes for a lot of interesting strategic and, and uh, decisions that you're thinking turns ahead saying how is this going to play out. We found that to be one of the most interesting mechanics that's in the game. Absolutely loved it. 
Um, really, there wasn't really much I didn't like about Octopus's Garden. The only thing I can think to bring up, and it's I think just a, a symptom of some of these uh, you know tile drafting games in general, is that there is this element of luck that can come into it. So you know, if if for instance I take a row and it was just an okay row for me, and then I refill the market with an absolutely amazing row for my opponent in a two-player game, I just handed them tiles that are based on luck that they're able to just grab and it perfectly helps their situation. Uh, one thing, uh, I, a game I compared it to called Cat Lady did to mitigate that was blocking a row or column that was just taken from being taken again immediately. I think a game uh, like, like this could benefit from that because it's not going to eliminate luck completely, but it does mitigate that uh, aspect of I just put out an exact perfect row or column for my opponent. Um, it could help those situations, but generally in, in the games we had, that only came into play once or twice where all of a sudden, you know, I took a row that was like, Oh, this is okay. I hope I don't give you this tile. I ended up giving Carlo the exact tiles he needed to be able to take take something and, and maximize his points. Just something to keep in mind. Obviously, the components um, and artwork is still a, a prototype, so anything can change. I'm not going to get into it too much. But based on our experience with the prototype, it's super pleasant looking on the table. Uh, really good table presence. Super fun. Lots of strategies. Like if you want to go that road, but also still a game that you can introduce to new players and and feel like they're going to grasp it really quickly and you're going to have fun with people of all ages. Um, I would highly recommend this to anyone who likes tile placement games. Anyone looking for uh, gateway games uh, for that you know will introduce new players, but it will st but still also hit the table even when you're not playing with new players. You're playing with more expert players. Um, I'm excited to introduce this to, to some of my friends that are more hardcore hardcore gamers because because I feel like we'll all dive into it from that strategic level and start getting really, really uh, interesting plays happening as we're trying to maximize our points. Um, there's just so much going on. I think that it, uh, my biggest recommendation is that on your first playthrough, don't think too much about the strategy. Just start learning the tiles and you know which ones are really powerful, how you want to play your hermit crabs, how you want to play your, your sea stars, starfish, um, to, to you know make sure that they hit the the oysters at the right time, when you want to move your hermit crabs onto homes and things like that, to really get a grasp of it. And then from the second game onward, I feel like you're just off to the races. Like that's when everything, you've wrapped your head around the concepts and now you can just have fun with it on whatever level that means to you. So I would highly recommend this to, to anybody looking for that kind of style of game. It's really, really fun. There's so much to love about this. I hope this video helped Joe with you making your decision. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'd be happy to answer. Again, thank you to Maple Games for sending us this prototype. Once again, the link to the Kickstarter is in the description if you want to go check it out for yourself. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.